everyone, and welcome. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard.com, Variety, Access.com, uh, Goldmine, and I don't know wherever I, wherever I can make any money. Bringing you another uh, episode of Things We Said Today, your go-to show for Beetle Talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce my two cohorts from uh, out in the uh, internet ether world. Um, first, from the state of Connecticut, um, the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And out in the state of Maine, our musicologist, the only one of us that really technically has ever been in a band more than five seconds. <laughs> Not um, true. Not true. <laughs> Were you in a band too? Yes. Oh, you don't, you don't know, know of my musical background. You see, know. I didn't know. Now, now, see, this is brand new. We're, this is all, you're, folks, you're learning this at the same time I am. Um, I didn't know that. I was in a band for, for about five seconds, so there. Uh, okay. Anyway, that's Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hi, Steve. Hello, Ken, and hello, oh. everyone. <laughs> what, a way to, what a way to start. Anyway, we got, we got a, a, a whole lot of stuff to talk about today. The, the big thing we're going to talk about is the Howard Goodall PBS special. But first, we have some Beatle news um, and a couple of things. One thing that um, I dug up today that I posted uh, on Access.com is that um, Herb Alpert's new album called Music Volume 1 has two Beatle covers on it. One of them is Michelle, and one the other one is uh, John Lennon's Imagine, which is interesting. And the, the, the Michelle is online. It's on YouTube. And it's actually pretty nice. I'm, I've always liked Herb Alpert's music, and I can, you know, back to the Tijuana Brass days. And this has a very Tijuana Brass kind of feel to it, as all his stuff does because of the way he plays his trumpet. But it's a, it's, it's a really nice, and it's got strings, it's got a little bit of jazz. It, have either of you guys heard this yet? Not yet. Okay. No, but I'm a big Herb Albert fan, and I will definitely listen to this. You know, he has covered Beatles songs before. Oh, mm-hmm. yes. Oh, yes, I know. Boy, yes, I know. Um <laughs> Many times uh, with the Tijuana Brass, he did. Um, right. But the big story in this, with this thing, with this uh, in uh, in my story about the the covers is not the the covers themselves. Is that he said he thought he had a chance to sign the Beatles to A and M Records and did not. And that's uh, that blew me away. I, what, I was. Uh, what does that mean, actually? Well, he like, here's what he said. Here's what he told Billboard. He said, when people ask me, do you regret anything? I was thinking, man, in 1962, after A&M Records started, the Beatles were hunting for a record company. They were on VJ for a while, and I guess nobody was coming to the party. I was thinking, man, if I had flown over to London just to see if we could do something, but the timing was off. I didn't get them at that moment. In retrospect, you think, man, they were available. Okay, so so it's not as if they had approached him and said – no. Okay. No, no, no. But he thinks that he had could have had the opportunity and did not. So it's interesting that he was aware of the Beatles. I mean, VJ, their music wasn't played that much in this country, only in little pockets here and there, as we've discussed before. So just being aware of their music is he saying that I mean, he was that he was aware, or that is he just well, looking back that, in no, retrospect? That, I mean, that's the full quote. That's the full quote from Billboard, and I I, I don't know that he was aware. I mean, I can't say from that quote that he was aware, but he must have been. I mean, from what he's saying, I was thinking in 1962 after A&M Records started, the Beatles were hunting for a record company. He must have had some kind of, not necessarily a feeler, but he probably was reading the, well, I don't know, there wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been in, in the mail. I mean, if he had seen the Liverpool press, he might have known who they were. I don't know. I mean, that's it's, a... That's a this it's needs some follow-up questions with Herb. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, put that on the list because it sounds to me like he's saying that you know I'm I'm looking back in 2017 and thinking I started my label in '62. Maybe if I had signed the Beatles, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean he knew that they were at the time right, looking right. for a label. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't, I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting historical. Yeah, we will make him roughly the same as basically every record executive in the universe since then. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. 
I just it thought just, it's, it's it's yeah I know that no I agree there's you know there there are questions there and, yeah. and questions that aren't answered. It's just um, when another, he mentions when he mentions VJ specifically VJ that tells me at least I think but he but he's he's, he's mentioning it now time. he's mentioning it now okay. everybody knows they were on VJ now right okay right it yeah. sounds like he knew then but I could be wrong yeah, yeah. another interesting story is that Stella McCartney's new. Uh, latest fashion uh, show includes stuff inspired from George Harrison. And it turns out that there's a, um, a, a from reading the story uh, from Women's Wear Daily, uh, there are some bo- boots, uh, short boots with a little ridge at the top. The design of that came from George Harrison's closet. And a plaid double breasted jacket is called the Harrison. And Stella said that um, Olivia gave her the privilege of looking through his stuff. So so there you go. Uh, George Harrison helped inspire uh, Stella's latest fashions. Okay. But the biggest story, and I don't know if you, uh, I assume, Ken, that you know, you are aware of this, is that Paul may be touring Australia. The uh, Melbourne Herald Sun reported today, and this is June 12th, that negotiations are... Uh, for dates in November and December are underway. And that would be the first time since 1993 that he has played in that country. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to play in 2002 and canceled because of the Bali bombings. And what I'm hearing is December, not November and December. And I'm also hearing an announcement could come very soon. So are you going to Australia, Ken? Surprisingly, no, Steve. Um, <laughs> I'm actually now going to three of Paul's shows. Oh, uh, are you? And, this, is, this, yeah. is a, this is a development. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm going to be going to the one in uh, Long Island at the Nassau Coliseum, the new yeah. Nassau Coliseum. I'm going to the one in uh, Madison Square Garden and at Barclays. You're going to be working for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> to pay off these tickets, yes. Right. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, I, I'm really glad that he's going to Australia. Um, as I, The story that hasn't been posted as I'm talking now. I mean, there are people, there are groups on Facebook, Australian fans that have posted on Facebook, that are, have been really frustrated and angry that he has bypassed uh, Australia over the years, and um, I'm glad this is finally happening. If, if indeed it does happen, I'm glad it's finally happening for them. Um, it's it's about time. So, sure, I'm very happy for the people in Australia. Yep. You know, it's long overdue. We don't really know the reason why. That's uh, that. Obviously, we don't, and uh, that's that's the weird part. Um, yeah, we don't know. So. Hmm. Anyway, okay. I'm, I'm glad that he is able to – he's finally going to do that. That's that's a good thing. And it also mm-hmm. is another indication that the tours will continue. So there we go. It's not yeah. – it ain't over yet. There's so. an article that I read about this, about Paul playing in Australia, where he's quoted as saying that he could see himself touring even when he's 80. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so. um, I can't see him touring when he's 80. I, I really can't. It's not, I, 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 it's not too far from now. No, I suppose not. Yeah, I know. I just. Uh, I know you what know. you're saying. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I can't. I keep thinking. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar. And I can't think of the name of the title of the song right now. Um, Randy Newman d- does a song, and I can't remember it. I remember when I saw the first time I saw Randy Newman, he actually mentioned. Paul McCartney as one of the people he was talking about in, in, in Stars Who Don't Know When to Quit. <laughs> yeah, he did. He actually mentioned him. Uh, so, anyway. I've got the article right here with Paul's quote. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't see that one. Is that the, That's not the Herald Sun article, is it? No, it's the NT News. Oh, okay, I didn't see that one. I didn't okay, see it, says one. Here, it says here, this is a quote from Paul. It used to be that doing this at 40 seemed unimaginable and unseemly. Doris Day once said to me, age is an illusion. Yes, Doris Day. (laughs) Okay, go ahead. Said Doris Day once said to me, age is an illusion. It's a big number the older you get. 
But if it doesn't interfere, I'm not bothered. You can ignore it. That's what I do. Hmm. Okay. That's a quote from Paul. Okay. All right. So that's that takes care of the news. We got a couple of things to uh, pick up on from last week. Um, the first thing was the release date on the Yoko reissues um, is July 14th, not June. I was mistaken about that. And actually, and, you say all the titles because it's um, it's Fly, approximately Infinite Universe, and Feeling, feeling the space. space. Yes. Yeah. And I was listening to Fly this morning on my walk and it's a very interesting experience to listen to yoko on and while you're walking it's even more interesting to do it while you're working out but okay <laughs> <laughs> certain songs certain songs work yes they do yes that they do that they do i think um, i think move, move on fast try that when you're okay Okay. And you're working um, out. Okay. All right. Anyway. Um, well, it's time for you to make the exercise tape with the uh, <laughs> authorized <laughs> soundtrack, Steve. Actually, there, there's, a subject, there's a subject for an upcoming show, a Beatles workout tape. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Yeah, I can, see, I can hear the groans. Yeah, I really. Can imagine, I, mean, <laughs> I can imagine what Al would have said. Al, if you're listening, I could hear you groaning. <laughs> uh, anyway. um uh, Ken, you were going to bring up a couple of things. Number one, about charts. Yeah, on last week's show, we had uh, talked about the fact that Sgt. Pepper had debuted at number three mm-hmm. on Billboard's Top 200. And we did, we weren't sure whether or not that meant the single CD, the double CD, the box set. How was right. it all figured out? And my contact at the record company at Universal said it's a combination of all of them. Okay. Which that's to me kind of, makes the most sense, right? And that's what we kind of suspected. By the way, I meant I forgot to mention when we were talking about the when I was going through the news, it dropped to number four this week, so it's down to, but it's still in the top ten. So hey, that's still very respectable to me. So very respectable, very yeah. very respectable. Um, and you were also going to mention we got a comment about something we talked about last week. Well, last week we were reviewing George Harrison's Brainwashed album, and we were talking about the song "Rocking Chair in Hawaii." Mm-hmm. And I had mentioned the fact that the song borrows heavily from Hank Williams' song called Long Gone Lonesome Blues. And if you listen, you can always bring up the song on YouTube. But there is that uh, riff that you hear, that da 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 And what Hank Williams does in the song is close to it. It's not exact. But one of our listeners wrote to us on our YouTube page. And we want to thank Jay Hutch for writing in, who says that the yodel... That was used in the song from Jimmy Rogers called T for Texas is closer to what George does in the song, hmm. which you could also bring up on YouTube. It's fascinating to hear this stuff. So uh, T for Texas, it's the exact same riff as what George used. But I also noticed that if you play the Hank Williams song, it starts off with I'm going down to the river. Da 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 You know, it's that same kind of idea. And George used those lyrics, too. So I have a feeling that if you listen to both those songs, from Jimmy Rogers and Hank Williams, they both influenced what became Rocking Chair in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So I would highly recommend you know, listening to both those songs. I, I'm going to definitely have to do that. Uh, well, I, I've, I've heard – I'm, I'm pretty familiar. I'm very familiar with Hank Williams, but not with so much with Jimmy Rogers. But I will have to – investigate that and look in, look into that song. Well, the Jimmy Rogers song came out long before Hank Williams, so it's possible maybe Jimmy Rogers' song influenced Hank Williams. Hmm. Whatever. It's, it certainly sounds like if you listen to both those songs, if you combine elements of both, you'd get something pretty close to Rock and Share in Hawaii. So I advise all of our listeners to check that out. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, let's get on to the main subject of the the week, and that is the Sgt. Pepper TV special uh, that was on PBS. And we've all watched it, and I'm going to say, first of all, I've seen uh, – I was looking around this afternoon, and I was looking at some other comments, and uh, apparently some people didn't like it. And I don't know – I we have not discussed how you guys feel about this, uh, so I don't know – what, what I'm getting into here, but I was surprised. I liked it, and I liked it a lot. 
Now, I will say, number one, that I did not see it with PBS interruptions, but I thought it was fantastic. I was quite surprised. The quality of the, the footage of the Beatles, for the most part, was superb. That was a big thing. That was fantastic. It was great hearing the outtakes. I was a little concerned going in on how Goodall would work, uh, uh, you know, I mean, because he's basically telling stuff that, you know, that a lot of us know already. But he did. I thought he did a fantastic job. He got technical. He, uh, I loved when he t- when he did the pullouts with the um, with the instrument with the uh, instruments. Uh, the whole thing was just really, I thought, really, really well done. You know, I there's probably not a lot of new stuff in there, but the way they put that together, I thought was very refreshing. And I thought it was, I thought it was extremely well done. I think that seeing it on TV with the, with the interruptions probably didn't help, you know, a lot of people, but I thought, I thought he did a great job. I I really did. I love the um, observation he had early on that a number of the songs were based on everyday events that was I thought that was pretty fantastic and his when he gets into the technical explanation of Strawberry Fields Forever and the and how the two takes were merged, I thought that was just astounding. I, I really, really liked that. I thought the graphic on Penny Lane where they showed the, the audio graphic was wonderful. I I really, really liked that. The superimposing of the Alice in Wonderland movie during the discussion of Lucy in the Sky I thought was was really, really nice. I've seen that movie, and it, it's a very cool movie. And I believe, without looking, I believe Peter Sellers is in, is in that. And there were also, uh, it, and you guys correct me, but I thought I heard a couple of things uh, from the outtakes that I didn't hear on the box set, which also kind of was nice. But for the most, I mean, I was pleasantly surprised. I really thought this was well done. So, hmm. Alan, what do you think? Uh, I guess I was a little less enthusiastic than you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I, I thought it was really nice. I thought it was a, a good program. I thought it was a good use of the time. I thought for um, the famed general listener that everybody appears to love so much, it was just uh, you know nice for them to hear things that maybe they didn't know. As you say, there really wasn't a lot of new stuff in there. I mean, including the fact that so much of it came from newspapers and cornflake boxes and mm-hmm. posters and, you know, that's that ground's been covered a lot. And there were some things that, you know, I, um, I can't remember actually some of the specifics. I've averted my my mind. <laughs> but <laughs> there are a number of things and you get this a lot now in Beatles articles and T V shows and radio things about how, you know, the Beatles were the first to do X and you know, they weren't necessarily. I mean there were there were some things that he was making claims for that, you know, really were were not that uncommon even at the time and even for them and um but the big leap for me i mean the one thing that i, I thought okay this is just 12 steps too far Uh-oh. was likening mm. you know with the, the the line he drew between little richard and penny lane i mean thank you thank you <laughs> alan <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was silly, actually. (laughs) It's, you know, I mean, okay, Little Richard played in triplets and, you know, uh, fine, and Penny Lane breaks them down differently. Well, yes, that's, that's because it's a different song of an entirely different kind in a different era and a different group of people, you know. Okay, Mm -hmm. it's different, it, but it's so different that, there's no path back to Little Richard from Penny Lane, really, apart from that it uses a piano, you know. And and he took actually quite a long time to do that. And, well, on one hand, there was something valuable that came from that. I mean, I think people watching it without any kind of technical musical background got a really good discussion of rhythms and how rhythms can be broken up in certain specific kinds of things that were a, a little Richard's signature. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and that's great. Nothing to do with Penny Lane, really. Um, so <laughs> okay, yeah. What did, so mm, yes. What did you What did you think of the the te- his technical discussion? And I I, I think he uh, he probably went a little far on on this about within you without you. What did you think about that? Because he was really he was he basically equated within you without you or, or said it was the most it was the Best song. It was the most techno- technologically advanced song on the album, which yeah, I, which I, I kind of had. A, I that that probably was was a, a, a little bit of an overreach as far as I was concerned. Well, yeah. And in fact, actually, he he also in his within you without you discussion, he talked about how until now, although the Stones and the Beatles had used the sitar as an Indian instrument as as color instruments, they hadn't really done it in an Indian kind of way, and 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 Love You Too kind of does. So that was that was a case where it was like this is the first time, you know, blah blah blah. But it's actually not the first time they've done it before themselves. Okay. I kind of think he might have overstated a little bit about what was. Sort of. I mean, it was interesting. The, the discussion of that song was really interesting because he was saying that it was something new for both worlds, the Indian music world and right. the pop music yeah. world. And, and of course, it was, you know. I really mm-hmm. liked when they had the Indian singer sing it in the way that an Indian mm-hmm. singer would sing the song. Mm-hmm. Um you know, that was interesting. That was really interesting. And, and mm-hmm. you know, and he had a point about that. But he kind of made it sound like George was sort of westernizing it because the Western audiences wouldn't have known how to deal with the Indian kind of singing. And I think it really has more to do with the fact that that just wasn't what George did, you know? I right. mean, he was mm. his his involvement with Indian music was instrumental, basically. He was... He was becoming a sitarist. He wasn't becoming an Indian singer, which is a completely different discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, look, I think it had a lot of good things in it. I, 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 I'm not, I don't want to trash it. Um, I think it's really good to have a musicologist explaining the Beatles in an elevated way, you know, and many, mm-hmm. many people have tried going all the way back to Wilfred Mellers. I don't know if you ever read his book, Twilight. Yes. You know, you know, my feeling with Wilfred Mellers was that he really loved the stuff, but he really didn't understand the stuff, you know, and, and he was bringing yeah. a kind of academic approach to it that just didn't really work, you know, and it, it didn't, it, it, it's kind of like he didn't quite get the spirit. I mean, he understood right. where the modulations were and what the chord changes were and all that, but he didn't quite get what the songs were about and everything. Right. And, yeah. I just dug that book out recently, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it was it was funny to to read through it and to see how, how much he missed the point, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Howard Goodall is like, you know, he's of the generation who grew up listening to this stuff, and he knows it and he's a trained musician, and that's a, a good combination. I just think that some of the claims that he made were went a little overboard. That's all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I do think I do think the cinematography in that thing was really great. Mm. And it also the other thing that that I was impressive. I, you know, I'm sitting there thinking all these p- people at home who don't have the box set may not even have Sergeant Pepper at all. And they're hearing all these outtakes for the first time, and I thought that was, you know, that was kind of a, a nice thing too. But mm-hmm. Ken, what would you think? Um, I pretty much can echo those words that Alan just said. Um, I liked a lot of it, but at the same time, I felt like Howard Goodall was reaching on certain points. Mm-hmm. For example, when he talks about she's leaving home, he was saying that the song was perhaps about uh, looking for sexual freedom. Uh, I don't really know, you know, why, because she met a man from the motor trade. I mean, this is all his interpretation of what the song's about. And when you listen to what John and Paul have both said about She's Leaving Home and and what the basis was for for writing that song, coming from an article about what was really happening, you know, maybe this girl ran away from home because she didn't feel loved. 
from her parents. And maybe she was given a lot of material things, but she still didn't feel loved and wanted. And it was taking it from the perspective of not only the girl who ran away, but the parents too. Mm -hmm. So that's what She's Leaving Home was about to me. But when you bring up the sexual freedom thing, I didn't know where that was coming from. I do agree with you, Alan, about the whole thing about Penny Lane. I, I did not see any Little Richard connection whatsoever. <laughs> there was something in there, and I got to ask the two of you, I hope I'm understanding this right. You're talking about Strawberry Fields Forever mm-hmm. and bringing the two versions together and changing the speeds. And did Howard Goodall actually say that at that time they didn't have very speed? on the tape machines. And so uh, in order to change the speed, they had to control the electrical power that went to the tape machine. He did say something like that. Yeah. He's, he, I don't yeah. remember him saying the electric power part, but he did say, he did say, yeah, that they didn't have, you know, that they were basically primitive and, uh, you know, in dealing with this kind of situation. Yeah, they did. Okay. Cause that's something I never heard of before. And I wasn't aware they didn't have very speed. I, we'd have to really double check on that. You know, but for the most part, I, I kind of felt like so much of this stuff, yes, I know that he's a musicologist, but a lot of this is over our heads for, for a lot of people, getting into music theory and trying to explain it. And it's nice to have that kind of approach once in a while, but I think it, it, there was too much over-analysis here. And I think this documentary would have been better served if other people had commented along with him, that it wasn't just Howard alone. I mean, the making of Sgt. Pepper, we've already discussed, is really a great documentary. Mm -hmm. And certainly it helps to have the participants that made Sgt. Pepper involved. And maybe at this point, maybe Paul and Ringo didn't want to say anything. They said what they had to already in that documentary. Obviously, we don't have George Martin here now. You could have used old clips. You could have had people. It would have been nice to have people like Jeff Emmerich involved in something like this, people who are really involved with the making of the album, or other people in music, more familiar names, who are deeply affected by, by the album. See, that's, now, that's, that's, that's more what I would, have, uh, I would have preferred something like that. This is a completely um, scholastic approach towards the album. And it's fine for what it is, but I, I felt like it, there was too much over-analysis here. See, now, going back to what you just said about uh, having people who were were affected by the album, who were, you know, um, that's the kind of thing that you see almost daily on, like, MTV and, and, and you know, um, you know, various, uh, various uh, channels and that's the kind of thing that really in my estimation really dilutes the the subject i like the fact that there was only one person here it would have been nice to have comments from from uh, paul and ringo and, and george and and john it would have been not, it would have been nice um and actually uh, i believe there was there were some comments at the beginning there were some vintage footage there was some vintage footage at the beginning but the fact that it was basically one person all the way through didn't bother. I didn't think that was bad. I, I, I thought it was a lot more focused that way. Cause then you get, you get a lot of these, you know, specials nowadays that have celebrities that are, you know, that really have very little to do with the situation. And, and I don't want to hear from them. And I'm glad they, that wasn't the case here. I'm glad they didn't water that thing down. Alan, what do what do you think? Yeah, I think this was meant to be a, a, a really basically an analytical presentation, and most of the people who they could have gotten on who would have meant anything to anybody wouldn't have been able to analyze in the way that he was analyzing, so it would have meant breaking for something different and watering down. What The one thing I would have was, was sort of waiting for that didn't happen, because I don't know that's, that – the necessary clip exists, but when he was talking about she's leaving home and the whole thing being in modes and Mm. finally Mm -hmm. talking about how the mode that was used in she's leaving home was the Aeolian mode. I was just (laughs) waiting for, I thought they just should have had a clip of John like hitting his forehead with his, um, (laughs) um, because, you know, a song in the Aeolian mode is going to have an Aeolian cadence. It just is, you know, (laughs) So, um, yeah, I thought that was sort of interesting. I mean, uh, actually, 
the thing about the Aeolian mode <laughs> is that for normal people, it's really just the key of A minor. Mm-hmm. There is nothing else about the Aeolian mode other than that it's it's basically A to A on the white keys. So that's the way the mode modes work. You know, Dorian mode was D to D mm-hmm. on the white keys. So, but it was nice that he showed and talked about modes and and all of that. Um, I think he you know, wasn't making too big a claim there when he was talking about the Beatles' use of modes because, you know, I mean, as as he said, modes are really, really, really woven into English folk music and, uh, you know, it's just something the Beatles would have intuitively had within them, you know. Um, mm. I don't think they sat down and said, you know, let's do something in the Aeolian mode. They might have said, let's do something no. in A minor. <laughs> mm-hmm. But... Okay. Um, yeah. The Beatles just did did things that were natural to them and what sounded right in their ears without having any, you know, knowledge of music theory of any kind. Mm-hmm. The yeah, same they... thing of uh, you know, what went on in the studio. They they were looking for different sounds and even if it was something that was unconventional that hadn't been done or shouldn't have been done. Uh, if it sounded right in their ears, they went with it, and that's how the Beatles worked. Yeah, it's it's basically the Louis Armstrong theory of of composition, uh, it, which was if it sounds good, it is good. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I mean, I yeah. I mean, we all, we have you know we have our opinions on it. I, I I know there's been actually some more much more critical opinions I've seen on Facebook, but I, I you know I really don't think. This deserves that. I, I can, you know, I, I don't think it was that bad. I think probably it'd be worse having to sit through the PBS interruptions. Um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I'd love to have seen what. Where, where I did did either of you guys see it on PBS? Because I did nope. not. Nope. I yes, saw I it, did. I saw it straight. What? Where were they? What were they giving away? Oh, okay. um, I think they. I think they were giving away the Sgt. Pepper box set. Really? Wow. I think so. Ooh. Yeah, with a with a nice pledge. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure that must have been that must have been pretty um yeah, okay. Anyway, um all right. So we're uh, that takes care of that. We got a couple of things um both um Ken and Alan participated in some events this week and we're going to just give you a little roundup on on those uh, Ken talk about the uh, Fab Four Music Festival in Connecticut that uh, you uh, were uh, one of the MCs for? Yeah, this is um, something that Charles Roseney has been doing for several years in Connecticut called the Fab Four Music Festival, but for a few years it was called Danbury Fields Forever because it was held in Danbury, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. But um, it was moved to the Oakdale Theater, which is a pretty well-known concert theater in Wallingford, Connecticut. And they had two different setups. They had um, an indoor stage and an outdoor stage, each of which had, well, I had nine bands that I introduced, and Charles had, I believe, 12. And they're all bands from the New York the New England area and New Jersey, and they're all tribute bands, and they all bring something different to the table. And that's what I like most about, well, I spent most of my time outdoors, not really paying that much attention indoors, but I had so many acts that I really loved, and the weather was beautiful. Mm-hmm. The crowd there was so receptive and warm to everybody. They were just there to spend an entire day hearing Beatle music, for the most part, Beatle music. But what I liked most of all was the mix of all the different acts. First of all, you had individual performers, you had duos, you had groups. You would have one person just doing Beatles as a group. You'd have one person just doing solo music. And uh, one person that uh, you're aware of, Steve, is Wayne Cabral, who's in the band The Onos. And Wayne and his wife, Rachel, put together Harry Fest every single year in Massachusetts. Mm. Okay. And that's, you know, that's a, a tribute to George. And you also hear other Beatles music, too, with, with uh, um, proceeds going to benefit cancer. But Wayne performed solo and also indoors with the Onos. And when he performed solo, it was all solo Beatle music. Plus, he did Yoko. He did, uh-huh. Kiss, he did Kiss, Kiss, Kiss live. Really? And he also did a few Todd Rundgren songs. You know, oh, wow. From uh, to face the music from the Utopia album, <laughs> since it was a parody uh, of of the Beatles. This is the great thing about going to what really are pure music festivals. It's kind of like a miniaturized version of Abbey Road on the River, except that you don't have guest speakers. It's just music. 
which was also recently uh, Happy Road in the River was uh, a couple uh, Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, uh, there was but, actually uh, a band that played just monkeys, and wow. they were they were fantastic. They were an incredibly tight band. Who was it? Who was the band? Because I've heard, I've heard of a couple of uh, monkeys tribute bands. Monkey uh, tribute band. David Tessier, and actually his band. Uh, whenever they perform, they play anything from from the 60s through the 80s. They're not strictly a monkeys band. But mm. for this show, they played Just Monkeys, and the crowd loved it. And they mm. even played, you love this, Steve, a song from Good Times. Ah, wow. So, uh, that's yeah, great. Me that's and great. Magdalena. How, how so, many? Oh, wow. that's, in, that's interesting, because if there's one song on that album that s- would seem very hard to play, that would be it. That's a, it that's seems not, to be a lot of fans picked that one out as being possibly their favorite. Yeah, but, I know it's it's. We, I remember when we had Fred Velez on the show. I was saying that that was a the mix on that could have been a lot better. But I, a lot of people li- like that. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. interesting. And actually, uh, we were talking about Wayne Wayne Cabral. He opened his set. Get this. <laughs> yeah. With Tommy's coming home. Hmm. Mm. One of the songs that Paul wrote with Elvis Costello, which hadn't been released until the New Flowers in the Dirt as both. Uh-huh. Shows demos so um you know i mean to start off with a song like that it gives you an idea of where he was going to go throughout this whole set and Mm. there were people that just played solo music there were there were bands that played a mixture of both there were bands that um stuck to the group and the more danceable stuff and then you went indoors which i went towards the end and you had more of the the bands that dressed up like the Beatles and wore the wigs. And uh, the last band, by the way, the Hoffners, um, they did most of Sgt. Pepper, wearing the Sgt. Pepper costumes and all. And mm-hmm. um, we had a big crowd. It was, how many, how many, I was going to ask you, how many, how many did, you get, did you get? Do you have an idea? Well, I'd have to ask Charles, but I'd have to say there was over 1,000. Okay. I would guess that. The most they could hold is 2,000, but I, okay. I'm sure we made it over 1,000. And um, that was a pretty successful day overall. I mean, just the fact that everybody came there to relax, spend the day hearing all this great music, hearing all this variety, that's what what made it so special for me. And um, yeah, I had a great time. I had a blast. (laughs) Okay, cool. Alan, you were in New York. You went went back to the Big Apple for, for a day. Yeah. Talk to, tell yeah. us about that. Well, I was on the, this panel at the Paley Center about the Summer of Love, which um, was actually streamed live on Facebook, and it's still on the Paley Center's Facebook page. You can um, you can stream it or download it. You know how much longer it's going to be there? I really don't know. Um, I'm surprised it's still there, actually. Um, but I okay. just I checked it just before we went on. You know, and it was uh, it was a good. It was fun. The rest of the panel was Graham Nash, who was the moderator, uh, Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and Papas, um, who, you know, part of this, since it was about the Summer of Love, was about Monterey Pop, and the Mamas and Papas were sort of involved in setting that up. And there right. was D.A. Pennybaker who filmed it, and, and there is um, a new uh, 4K version of the film coming out um june 15th i think is its premiere and presumably they'll um they'll put it out on on uh, blu-ray um and there's al- there's also there's also a 2017 monterey pop festival uh happening out here on the west coast mm-hmm. in monterey uh, and wow. some, of the, some of the original people i think eric burden is one of them wow. are involved yeah so Kenny Loggins, who I had been wondering what his connection to this was because he comes from a slightly later era. But actually, he was at Monterey Pop as a, a spectator. Really? Um, and oh. completely wow. by accident. He was, you know, just sort of uh, – he lived in California and um, some friends were out driving and said, hey, you want to come with us? We're going up to Monterey and got in the car. They didn't even mention the festival just <laughs> when they got there, they you know got in, and uh, so mm. he, so he saw that, and 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 then there was me, and I guess I was there to comment on Beatles related things mostly, although I ended up um, also doing some historical things about the Summer of Love because I was young enough to 
<laughs> still, <laughs> still remember. Um, oh. You know, the the funny thing is that uh, you know, normally in a in a group like that, you would think, okay, you've got a bunch of rock stars and a filmmaker and one journalist. You're probably going to have the journalist be the moderator because we're right. just asking questions, and not to mention that. You know, I was 12 in the summer of 1967. Did you, did you mention that? Did you mention that? <laughs> well, no, not exactly. But, um, I mean, I, I, I did when they asked me and, and said, uh, Graham wants to moderate it. I, I said, you know, my, my big fear here is that Graham Nash is going to turn to me at some point and say, so, Alan, um, you know, when the rest of us were – playing our music for huge crowds and smoking weed and having sex round the clock during the summer of love. But what was it like being 12? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that didn't happen, but he did at some point <laughs> say to me, well, so how old were you when, when the Beatles first oh, came? Wow. <laughs> I thought, oh yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, it was good because, uh, you know, basically he also asked me about – the talk was framed with the two filmed versions of All You Need Is Love, the black and white original, and then at the end they played the colorized version. Mm. And, okay. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, and Graham Nash actually was at that session. You know, he had been invited ah. by, by Paul earlier that day um, and came down and, and was one of the participants, um, you know, walking around with a sign probably, or I don't know if he had a sign or not, but, you know, Donovan was there and Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people there. And um, so he had asked me, um, okay, you know, could tell us some things that people don't know about this, about what we just saw. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what, you know, when I, when I was, once I was at Beatles, Beatle Fest, when it was still Beatle Fest, um, mm -hmm. when my first book came out, the fight in one from the cavern to the rooftop. And the right. guy said to me, so tell us some things people don't know about the Beatles. And, I said, well, I, you know, I, I have no way of knowing what other people don't know about the Beatles. It became sort of an epistemological question, you know, for me. Was, but so this time I thought, okay, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and so I talked about how, you know, basically the Beatles had a big safety net for that. I mean, they, they basically had recorded the tracks beforehand. They just had a live vocal. They had George's little solo. They had, uh, and they had, the string and brass players playing live at the session. So I asked him, you know, you were in the room. How did it sound to you? Did it sound like a track was being played and they were adding, or did it sound complete as you were sitting there listening? And he said it basically sounded like they were doing it, you know. Hmm. So oh. I, I thought that was sort of interesting. I mean, otherwise... Um, you know, it was was it was kind of interesting hearing. You know, he he has a lot of stories about the Beatles, including having seen their uh, appearance at the Carol Levis auditions in Manchester in 1959. He was in the crowd there. Um, oh, I think, wow. wow! I think, um, I think they may the the proto Hollies uh, may have played at that too um, because they were out you know playing gigs I mean he's doing that since he was 15 and uh, the thing is that in his story he conflated it with the Larry Parnes audition where Johnny Hutchinson played drums and they were looking for someone to back uh, Billy Fury he has all the details of both auditions in this one story. <laughs> hmm. So um, I'm not sure why. Uh, you know, it's, it's probable that he was at the Manchester one, but not at the Liverpool one. Not sure. But uh, in any case, so he, he, told, he told that combo story. And um, I think this is where you sort of figure, you know, okay, I'm not going to correct that. I mean, I'm not here to be the school marm, you know, about – you know, this or that fact being wrong. Well, there were some strange questions. I mean, there was a one guy um, who was a friend of Clive Davis kind of asserted that 
Clive Davis, when he went to Monterey and saw Janis, basically invented rock for Columbia Records that all Columbia had at that point was Paul Revere and the Raiders. But, you know, all of us collect records and all of us can take five seconds to think how untrue that is. You know, <laughs> Dylan. Bob Dylan, yeah. The Birds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, Moby Grape, which was one of the people that was that Kenny Loggins talked about being knocked out by it at uh, Monterey. I think they were already recording for Columbia by then. Uh, there were the, it, it, it wasn't entirely a label devoid of rock music but uh simon and garfunkel simon and garfunkel <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so uh yeah you know the 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 guy from the paley center was sitting next to me ron simon who's their curator and uh is in charge of these things and actually the the two of us just sort of were saying you know oh, simon garfunkel bob dylan Rosie, you know and, <laughs> and i hadn't realized like the mics were picking this up <laughs> Ooh, so, ooh, hot so, mic. Yeah. Ooh. So I found that out when I talked to Paula afterwards. You know, <laughs> she'd watch the stream. So, because she couldn't come with me. But, oh, that's that's yeah. funny. But, it, you know, it was, was, it was how fun. How was Michelle Phillips? She was good. You know, I mean, she, um, you know, she her, her memory isn't quite what it was even a few years ago when she used to turn up at those PBS fundraisers. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, she remembered some stuff. She remembered some interesting stories and, uh, you know, it was, it's, was great, you know, just having her there, you know, as a representative of, I mean, look, she's the last surviving member of the Mamas and Papas at this point. Right. And, right. and, uh, and I, I always really love the Mamas and Papas. I mean, it's just, it's Same just here. great stuff. Mm-hmm. I still listen to them. So, yeah, I mean, the whole thing was a lot of fun. Kenny Loggins was really pretty nice, too. Um, and it was interesting hearing his perspective as an audience member in Monterey. So a lot of it was about Monterey more than the Beatles as such. The Beatles kept coming up because of, you know, Pepper kind of had a, mm-hmm. a cast a big shadow on the summer of 67. Mm-hmm. Um, what was said about Sgt. Pepper? Do you remember? Basically, uh, well, basically half the people on the stage had advanced copies because um, (laughs) Graham Nash got his from Brian Epstein, you know, significantly before it came out. And he told the story about um, the Turtles coming to the UK for their first trip. And he uh, sort of invited them to his flat um, right from Heathrow. And uh, sat them down. Um, then they smoked for a couple of hours. Hmm. And he said, "So you guys uh, feeling nice and relaxed? Okay, I'm I'm going to play you something." And he he had it apparently on an open reel tape, and he threaded it up and played it, and he, he it just sort of blew their minds, so to speak. Um, <laughs> Michelle would have gotten a copy from Derek, who was in L.A. at the time and was right. involved in setting up the Monterey Pop Festival, too. It's Derek Taylor. Mm. Folks. So they had it before, you know, basically anyone out there did. And they listened to it and said, wow, you know, how are we going to keep up with this kind of thing? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they were doing something different. I, I don't see a Mamas and Papas Sergeant Pepper coming up, you know. Plus, at that point, they were in, I think, a, a certain amount of disarray. You know, the Mamas and Papas was pretty much coming to an end, mainly to do with various people Michelle was having an affair with, and John was not happy about it. They kicked her out once, actually, mm-hmm. for a couple of months just before the Monterey Pop Festival. Um, and she showed me a picture that she had in this book that she carries with her of her sitting next to... Uh, actually at Monterey and sitting next to her is Jill Gibson, who Mm. was the woman they brought in to replace her um, Mm. when they kicked her out for a couple of months. And she said, you know, she said we were great friends and we stayed great friends, (laughs) but yeah. As I recall, she was having an affair with Denny Doherty too. Well, she was, she she was with both. Apparently the affair with Denny Doherty, um, you know, was sort of forgiven, although it caused a lot of disarray within the group because Cass was madly in love with Denny Doherty. Right. Right. John was married to Michelle, you know, um, but apparently, uh, the, the last straw was that, um, I think it was, it wasn't grandpa's, I think it was Gene Clark of the birds, 
Um, and she was sort of okay. really open about that. And that kind of upset John enough that he got the others to sign a letter firing her. Mm. So she was fired by letter signed by the other three mamas and papas. And, uh, yeah, but uh, you know, I mean, she got back together by the, the she got back by the time of Monterey, and you know, if you look at the performance, it, you know, they all seem relatively happy. I mean, who knows right. when you're looking at performers, they're performers, you know, they may not be happy even when they look happy, but but who mm. knows? Uh, they and isn't them. it true? Isn't it true that uh, when the Beatles finished recording Sgt. Pepper, they went right over to Mama Cass's apartment? That was in London, and they played it for her? Yeah, there was some. I read something about that. I wonder what she was doing there at that time. I don't know. Hmm. But she was amongst the first to hear it, and they had the windows open, and they blasted it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I can only imagine the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that story is in the book that comes with the uh, box set, I think. Um, yeah. I think Jeff Slate wrote that. Or, mm. the, or one of the British underground guys, because apparently mm. the copy was Sandy Denny's copy. Was that it? Mm. Oh, man. Who, you know. who didn't have a copy of that? <laughs> yeah, everyone seems to have got early copies except, you know, us 12-year-olds who were sitting yeah, there really. waiting for it to come out. Really. You know, but, right. Well, hey, I got an early copy of the box set, so. Yeah. There you <laughs> so there. There you go. There you go. Yeah, but oh, anyway, yeah. it was it was a lot oh, of fun. Yeah, and oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just saying that it was a lot of fun, and it was uh, you know enlightening in, in in certain ways, and um, you know it's it's still up there if anyone wants to watch it. So, okay, yeah. Oh, hmm. Thank you. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'm glad to see that the the uh, pepper box is still floating around on the on the charts. I, it it looks like so far that. You know, everybody's very happy. I mean, you were saying last week that there were people that were complaining, but I'm not hearing a whole lot of complaints. I haven't heard one complaint <laughs> from anybody, really. really? Yeah. I mean, there's very little. There's very little that you can complain about. Right. About this. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, people do seem generally happy with it, and you know, everyone is kind of digesting it i mean most of the people i know got the box set and so that's a lot of material to kind of live with for a bit you know that's a really interesting thing here i mean we're talking a hundred you know 150 dollar for you know uh high-end or high-priced box set and that's what everybody bought i mean everybody could have just paid you know 15 bucks and gotten the two disc disc set with one disc of outtakes but right. most people apparently didn't do that and that that's not the way this usually works right and what does well, that I'd, tell I'd us i'd like to see i'd like to see a breakdown yeah really i for doubt each we'll configuration ever, i really doubt we'll be able to get a breakdown it'd be nice but i really really doubt it but yeah what does that tell us and what it, it are you know are they gonna i still have to i still have to think that even though you know, we've had the discussion. We've had the possibility of me mentions that they might do something more. I really don't think it's going to be anything on this scale. I really don't. I would be amazed. I would be amazed. I would be amazed. Well, if a lot I'm of sure people you know bought it. <laughs> but that. But we're talking. We're talking Pepper versus the other albums. Pepper is Pepper <clears throat> as as Al often. And I'm mentioning Al again. As Al often said when he was here, it was their. You know, it was their iconic album. It was, you know, it was the album. Although I, you know, I have my my uh, feeling for Abbey Road too. But yeah, I mean, an awful lot of people out there don't consider Pepper their favorite, and would be perfectly happy to buy a, this much of a box set of whatever is their favorite. You know, we're yeah. talking about the Beatles. Well, yeah. I agree. No, I know that. I, I consider every album important. Yes, I'm not saying I'm not saying I, I'm I'm thinking of it from a marketing standpoint more than anything else, and from a marketing standpoint, you can't look at every album like you can Sgt. Pepper. I really don't think you can. It'd be nice, but I'm I and and as a fan, I sure as hell would love to see, you know, every album done this way. But I as a you know realistically, I really don't think it's going to happen. If I'm wrong, well, hey, I'll, it won't be the first time I'm wrong. It only seems natural now 
since we're all so anniversary crazy in this culture, mm-hmm. <laughs> that next year we'd have a 50th anniversary White Album. Right. And then the next year, a 50th anniversary Abbey Road. And then the next year, perfect timing for a 50th anniversary Let It Be with the brand new DVD Blu-ray. I hope That's they right. don't wait that. I hope they don't wait that long. I hope they don't wait that long. And uh, that's you know for for the first generation fans like myself, that's one thing that really is is kind of a a, a bit of a worry that we're not going to be around to see that to see this stuff, see and hear it. And uh, I hope at least with Let It Be, they come outside the box. They can always stick the Let It Be DVD. In a you know in a 50th anniversary box, but damn it, don't wait for 50 years to put that stupid DVD out, please. You know. Well, I, I think it's ridiculous to try to to pick apart what you think is the most important of all their works because they're I all didn't, important. I, didn't, I never. No, I'm not I, saying, no, I wasn't. I'm not I wasn't saying doing you're that. doing it. I'm not saying you're doing it. Okay. You single out like Let It Be should be more important. You know, there's no reason on this earth why we shouldn't have a similar treatment to the White Album. You already know you've got the demos for one CD. Yeah, <laughs> that's already right there. That's a lock right there. And then yeah. you've got all the alternate takes in the studio of songs. You could easily have two discs at least. Yeah, of of bonus material with the White Album. And I bet there's a lot of White Album stuff that we don't even know about that they've got hidden oh, away. Sure. I mean, if if you look if you look through the um, you know the, the the books that have all that stuff listed. And I, well, for Lewis and I mean, if you look through Lewis and look at all all the stuff that's there, you know, yep, that we have not heard. There's there's a lot of stuff we have not heard. Well, so. even though we have absolutely no proof of this, I think there's a growing movement of people who do believe we're going we're going to be getting the White Album at Abbey Road. You know, well, plus um, Giles slipped. Yeah, I, uh, he said he yeah, said will be next. So yeah, I think <laughs> well, they're I think they're working on it, and and I think White Album is a logical uh, next one, and so is Abbey Road. What they do with Let It Be, whether they leave it in sequence or or not, I mean, hey, you know, they, they could do Let It Be early because it really does come before Abbey Road, but that means mm-hmm. doing two of these in a year, and I, I think they're a little timid about that kind of thing, but, no. uh, but they right. ought to. We also don't know what they're going to do for Christmas. So, who knows? What could what could be happening this Christmas? I'd be, I'd be shocked if anything came out. I think one release a year is enough. It's well, the what Beatles. About, what about just putting out a, you know, a regular old... CD of the Christmas flexies. Mm-hmm. I know that's one thing I've been I've always wondered why they haven't done with I a mean, complete would... version of Christmas Time is here again. Right. Yep. Helen, damn it, you need to get hired by them. Would you guys? What, if, what about me? You're always saying Alan should be hired. What <laughs> well, about he, me? He, I have a bigger what mouth. Am I top liver here? <laughs> you, what, what, Alan? What'd you say? I just said I have a bigger uh, mouth. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here we go. We all should get hired, actually. So there. All right. I think we're we're running out of time. Uh, so if you want to get a hold of the show, you can write. Things we said today, radio show at gmail dot com. Or, or, um, and if you would, if you do write us, tell us where you are listening to us from. We would like to know. You can contact us on Facebook um, at Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. We each have individual Facebook pages of our own. I have a. Um, a Beatles news and information group that you're welcome to join. You can contact me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I'm going to pass the pass it to Ken, who's going to tell you how to get a hold of him. Go, okay. I have my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. And as always, my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to briefly mention that I'm going to be making appearances on two things. There is another Beatles podcast, actually a Paul McCartney podcast, that I've been on once before. It's a relatively new show called Two Legs, and it's hosted by two guys who listen to this show, Tom Hunyadi and David Gargolino. And when hello, I was on hello, before, Tom and, hello, Tom and David. Uh, Go ahead. When I, was, when I was on before, we reviewed Paul's singles 
from 1971, starting with Another Day, through the end of 74, which would have been Junior's Farm. And in this show, we talk about a continuation from Listen to What the Man Said to Wonderful Christmas Time, taking you to the very end of 1979. <laughs> and I might add, I talk a lot about this show on this okay. podcast. Okay. So uh, if you want to listen to it, it's going to be posted this Friday or Saturday. That would be June 16th or 17th. And it happens to be on podbean.com, just like we are. So if you go to podbean.com in the name search, just type in Paul McCartney, and the first show that you will see will be Two Legs. Okay, so I'll be on that show. I was also interviewed on a TV program. It was a cable access show in North Haven, Connecticut. And I was interviewed by Bill Delane uh, to talk about the Sgt. Pepper album with two of my friends, one of which happens to be Charles Rosene, and the other is Rich Appel, who hosts a really great, one of the best oldie shows I've ever heard. It's on about 80 stations right now. It's called That Thing with Rich Appel. And so we're all talking about Sgt. Pepper in the show. If you want to watch that interview, it is online right now. It's on Vimeo. V-I-M-E-O. And when you bring that up in the name search, just type in the host name, which is Bill Delane, D-I-L-L-A-N-E, and you will see all of his shows up there. And one of them was has the Sgt. Pepper album cover in the front, so that would be the show. So if you want to catch uh, that program, which I'm on with two other uh, guests, Charles Rosday and Rich Appel, uh, that would be the way to do that. Also, I want to remind everybody I'm giving away a pair of tickets to see Joey Molland in concert. He's playing at Daryl's house on July the 2nd, playing the entire straight-up album, the Bad Finger album. And the way to do that is by going to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, look up ticket giveaways, and you can win a pair of tickets for that. Okay. As well Thank as all the Beatles trivia, too, on my website. All okay. right? Thank you, Ken. Uh, Alan, how, how do people get in touch with you? Oh, probably the easiest way is either through the group email or on Facebook under either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. There it is. That's it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I did That, that was short. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, uh, I guess we are about uh, out of time. This is Steve Marinucci for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. 